This Boris Effects webinar replay is brought to you by our technology partners, Dell, NVIDIA, and Intel. Great, well, hello everyone, and welcome to uh, this little introduction to Silhouette Paint. Um, so over the next hour, I'm gonna be showing you a few different things that we can do with, uh, with Silhouette Paint um, to do some sort of basic uh, set extensions, some removes, and a bit of beauty work as well. So we've got a lot to uh, a lot to get through. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Silhouette Paint to begin with, and and where it sort of sits within uh, the paint world, and why you might want to use it. Uh, because Silhouette Paint is a plugin for Adobe and OFX, and it's actually the the version of uh, Paint that you find in the full big boy version of Silhouette. So you've got all that sort of functionality that you have in a, a very high-end product, uh, a product that if you've you know watched any recent Hollywood blockbuster, uh, you'll have seen some stuff, some shots that have gone through Silhouette, I'm pretty sure. Um, so you've got all of that in you know your regular Adobe and OFX hosts. So what makes Silhouette Paint special is the fact that it is this, this hybrid paint system where you've got um, speed of raster paint and the sort of repeatability of vector paint. And we're gonna come back to what all of that stuff means in just a moment, but uh, the type of stuff that you can do with it is, well, you can do some of the sort of fun roto animating stuff that we have here, or do removes or extensions, uh, and a bit more of the, the animating there, but you can do that right within either your compositor or your editing host. And I think we'll we'll take a little look and see what makes Silhouette a bit special. So if I come back out here, now I said that it was a uh, a, a hybrid system of of uh, a raster with the repeatability of vector, but we need to figure out what exactly that means. Uh, I'm going to show you. I mean the we're in After Effects at the moment. We're going to be uh, moving around between different hosts at various points. But um, when you're working in After Effects, or in fact, most host uh, paint systems, they are vector paint, which means that if I come into our little paint system here, uh, let's just paint this up a little bit, do, do, do. We can, you know, make a few little different strokes down here. And all of our strokes are available if I just come down to the bottom here there we go all of our strokes are selectable and available down at the bottom so what this means is that we've got a huge amount of flexibility with with vector paint so we can you know at any point we can sort of turn layers off on and off uh, we can track these through uh, or I can even actually if we come down to the transform there I can even kind of just do simple position changes just within our frame. And this is all cool. So we've got you know a lot of uh, a lot of flexibility with vector paint. One of the issues with vector paint is that as soon as you start to build up lots of strokes, that every time, every frame you go to, you have to render down all of those strokes. So if you've you've only got a few strokes, that's actually not a big deal. But once you start getting into the, you know, the tens, the hundreds, or, you know, then the, the thousands of strokes uh, for some of the, the bigger shots, you know, you can really start to feel your system kind of grinding to a halt. So that's, that's vector paint. The other, the other thing we've got, the other type of paint we've got is actually something that you would find in Photoshop, which would be raster paint, where I could come in, Let's just zoom in a little bit here so you can see it. Well, I can come in, I can make some some changes up, uh, you know, here, here and here. And that's all good. I'm happy with the result there. I can save it out. But then I have no idea where my strokes actually are. As soon as I've saved out this file, those strokes are just part of the uh, of the overall image. So we we really don't have a way of kind of going back um to a previous state uh, if we need to make any changes at a later date other than you know using lots of layers and erasing little different bits but the other thing is is that it's not repeatable if you were 
you know, trying to do a lot of paint work within Photoshop, which people do, um, you have to then go in and paint on every single frame. And the fun thing about painting on moving images is that if your strokes aren't nice and consistent, uh, that's something that is very, very easy to see as soon as you play it back. But one static frame can look perfect. Um, another static frame can look perfect. But as soon as you play that through, any sort of small inconsistencies just you know, start to scream out at you. And that's, that's no good. That kind of gives the whole game away that you've, you've made some changes. So that brings us back into Silhouette Paint. And Silhouette Paint is this, this great system where we have the speed of raster. So we're painting on, uh, with, with just you know, those fast raster strokes as we were in Photoshop, but we have the ability to move those over time as we do with, with Vector Paint. And we can sort of play those back and uh, let's just get rid of Photoshop in the background. There we go. Yes, yeah, so we can sort of play those back and make sure that those are uh, running in uh, nice and fast. Has a, uh, After Effects crashed or is it just taking a little rest? It's it's just taking a little rest, everyone. It's okay. There we go. We're back. So this is the um, the first shot. We, we're going to get into uh, into silhouette now, I think. Uh, actually, let's come into our actual shot. After Effects, After Effects isn't feeling it right now. Okay, tell you what I'm going to do. We're going to have a quick save and we're going to come back in. Oh no, we're back. We're back. Okay, so this is this is the first shot we're going to be looking at. We're not going to be finishing this shot, but we are going to be using some of the same techniques that I used to actually create this shot up. So we're going to be extending out the buildings uh, and and seeing what we can start to do there. Okay. So silhouette paint is applied as any sort of regular effect. So I'm just going to come into my effects, Boris effect, silhouette, silhouette paint. And if we just look at the controls that we have here, it's very, very, you know, innocuous. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, sort of seem to scream out that it can do a lot. And that's because we have to open up the silhouette interface. And as soon as we open everything up, we're coming into silhouette and it's telling me that my license is going to expire but that's fine so when we create up a new silhouette paint project we're actually saving out a uh, a new file uh, and this is important for a few different way a uh, few different reasons uh, reason number one is it gives us a little bit more sort of resilience if um if our main project crashes or you know if our uh, if After Effects crashes, as it was very close to then, because we've got Silhouette Paint as a separate file, uh, then you know we haven't lost any of our paintwork. The other important thing that this lets us do is it lets us transfer this project between different hosts. So I can start a project in After Effects and finish it off in Nuke, or I can start a project in Nuke and finish it off in Resolve, and it, it doesn't really matter where you where you start it. Those projects are going to be cross uh, cross host compatible. Uh, we'll see that as well. So if I call this one building extend webinar, uh, and I'll save it into uh, a folder. Uh, I'll save it into my my silhouette paint folder. I keep keep I try to keep things nice and um, nice and organised. See here. I'll save that into there. Uh, and we can work at either 8-bit or 16-bit or 32-bit float. Um, I'm just going to work in 8-bit because our, our original image is just 8-bit, so we don't really need to do too much with that. And here we have our shot in Silhouette Paint. Now, if this is the first time that you've seen Silhouette or the first time you've seen Silhouette Paint, I'm just going to give you a very quick rundown of the important bits of the, um, of the interface. So probably the main thing you want to see is uh, the tools on the left hand side. So we've got lots of different tools that are going to be doing lots of different things. We've got blemish tools, blur, sharpen, clone, color, uh, dodge, burn, you know, all your all your favorite types of uh, of paint tool. 
uh, we're going to start with that. We'll start with just a color. Uh, but as, as you'll see, if I click through these, you'll see down at the bottom that our parameters are going to change. So down at the bottom here is our tool parameters. So if I have color selected, I've got the contextual parameters for the color. So I'll come in, I'll choose a uh, blue, maybe I'll choose a nice little cyan there. And I can just start painting on the screen. In fact, if we choose a yellow so we can see that a bit easier, there we go, it's gonna be painting up there. Just to the right of the parameters down here, we have the uh, brush profile. So this is how our brush looks and we can change up things like the size, the opacity, softness, all that sort of fun stuff. Now, because we're gonna be doing this, uh, changing up size and softness a lot, we do have keyboard shortcuts for, for doing all that fun stuff. So um, if you're used to working in Photoshop, you know, the keyboard shortcut for making your brush bigger and smaller, square brackets, that works in Silhouette Paint as well. But probably the, the way that I use the, uh, the brush mainly is actually just by clicking, or sorry, holding down the control or command key and clicking and dragging, I can make my brush bigger or smaller there. There we go. And if I hold down the shift, control or command key, I can make my brush harder or softer. So if we have a look down at the profile at the bottom here, just so I'm clicking that back and forth, I can make that a nice hard brush or a nice soft brush. Beautiful. There we go. Well, this is, uh, this is art, I suppose. Now, all of these strokes have been recorded down in the bottom left-hand side in my paint history. So this works for a number of different things. Uh, we can use this as just like a straight undo. So I can just control or command Z and just undo some of these strokes. But what this also does, it records everything that I've done on this frame up till now. So it records the, the type of stroke I made and all the parameters that are attached to that stroke. This is gonna be really important. Not now, but in about 10 minutes. So I'm just gonna undo all of this and start afresh. We've got nothing here. And I'm gonna come into my clone tool. Now, the clone tool is probably the tool that uh, uh, most people are, are sort of very familiar with, whether it's from uh, Photoshop or After Effects or, you know, any, any sort of uh, other regular um, uh, paint, paint tool. So what the clone tool does, it clones pixels from one area to another. And in its simplest form, we don't have to even think about what's going on down in the parameters down here. Uh, the parameters down here looks if it's you know got a lot of stuff that uh, we can do with it and we can but most of the time what you're going to be doing is you're going to be holding down the shift key clicking and dragging to set your source and destination and then once you've done that you can just sort of paint that up we can make that brush bigger as before and just paint that up so that's that's one way of doing it and that's probably the easiest way if you're just sort of trying to clone out sort of small blemishes where you're not trying to line up any big patterns you know just shift click over to the side and then just draw up or draw draw a little dot whatever you need to do but we can do a lot more with the clone tool here if I come down into the uh, uh, the clone parameter area We've actually got different ways of seeing what these brushes are going to be doing. So we've got different compare modes. Uh, and the ones we're gonna be looking for in the clone uh, are gonna be our um, align mode. Let's just reset this. So the align mode is basically just, say just, is basically a, uh, a sort of difference mode. So we can align stuff up. So if I uh, hold down shift and drag this up now, you can see that I'm getting a, um, a sort of difference mat of where I can, or difference mode of where I can sort of line up those those buildings. So if I'm looking over the, uh, what they call over the balconies, over the top there, we can see whether all those lines are gonna be matching up. And then when I let go, I turn off the align mode, 
I'm going to start painting that up a little bit there as well. Very nice. This this works absolutely great for um, uh, for patterns. Uh, so you can you can really see what what you're doing with that. Uh, the other sort of nice way of working is with the uh, onion skinning mode, which is actually quite similar. So we can come in and we kind of see a, an onion skin, a blend between those two. And we can change where the blend goes just using the uh, the slide down here. Now, if we're lining something up, as you saw, if I if I was just doing the shift drag and I wasn't quite pixel perfect, and I had to try another do do another little shift drag there, you see that I was always starting from the same um, same point. So I'd have to get this pixel perfect uh, when I let go. There's actually another way uh, which makes this type of thing a lot easier. Uh, and this is one of my, my favorite things about the clone is the interactive mode. Uh, and if I turn on interactive mode, we get this other little UI come up. So I can click anywhere in this UI, or sorry, anywhere in this um, square and just be changing the position. I can change rotation. I can change scaling, skew, and if I click over on the, the corners here, I can even change up the uh, uh, the corner point, uh, the corner pin distortion. So this this is great for just coming in and making sure that I really do hit the uh, the area that I want to uh, to hit, which is going to be around about there. Making sure that I'm lining up on my uh, balconies over on the the left and right side. We also have a region mode. Uh, so if you come out of interactive mode, we also have a region mode so I can set up a region um, just by clicking and, and dragging around it. And then that will be my interactive region that I can sort of really focus on just distorting on that particular area. Um, it's, it's very useful. So as soon as I turn off interactive mode now, I can sort of paint that up. There we go, lovely. Boom, boom, boom. And I've now got my uh, my duplicated or my extended building there. Just tidy that area up over there. So now once I've got this in, this is looking all right. I think I could probably clean up the, um, uh, the sort of corners a little bit there. And if I think I can clean up the corners, I'm gonna go over to my eraser tool, maybe make this a little bit smaller. And I can just hold down the Alt key and just get nice sharp edges just by clicking with the Alt key held down. I can sort of click from one area to another, which is gonna be great for giving me the sharp edges that I need for this building here. There we go. And I'll just zoom out a little bit, pan around, and we can have a look at the before and the after or just use the keyboard shortcuts one and two just to go before and after. So this is cool for one frame. But if I move to the next frame, it's disappeared. So I want to now take all of my different paint strokes that I've already done here, and we're gonna copy those over to the other frames. Now, this is a moving image. If this wasn't a moving image, this would be really, really easy because I'd just be able to go into uh, auto paint, which is the stuff in the bottom left hand corner. I could just choose the strokes I wanted to um, uh, to duplicate. Choose where I wanted to duplicate those two, just maybe the work range, and then just paint those forwards. But that's not going to work with this shot because this is a moving shot. So we're going to come into the the other module here. So if I go up to the uh, top left-hand corner, I can come into the Roto module. And the Roto module, as we're gonna see uh, in a little bit, uh, actually probably in about ooh, eight minutes, I would say, that's my guess. Uh, we're gonna see that we can use the Roto module to actually create up shapes that we can use to hold in and hold out our paint. But probably the main thing that we're gonna use our uh, Roto module for is to do motion tracking, to drive that auto paint. So we can use, uh, we can track this shot in and then let Silhouette Paint do all the hard work. 
So I've taken all these these shapes, which are going to uh, which I want to track in, and I'm just going to put these into a uh, into a layer. And let's put those in. There we go. Plop. And I will call this layer buildings. If I can actually spell buildings, there we go. Buildings foreground. And I'm going to track these in. If I come to our trackers, I've actually got three different types of tracker. I've got a uh, point tracker, a uh, planar tracker, and a well, silhouette planar tracker. And I've also got Mocha's planar tracker. Now, I'm not going to go through what these are uh, all good for. We, we actually don't have time for all of that nice, fun stuff. Uh, and I'm, I'm just going to hit track forwards uh, because we, we do have a lot of stuff that we can do with the motion tracking. Uh, good, solid motion tracking is vital for paint. I, I don't know how to overstate that um, you know, in, in any way. If you don't have really good uh, motion tracking data, then your paintwork is going to be uh, a lot more hard work than it actually needs to be. Uh, because we're going to use motion tracking for um, not only you know, uh, bringing in the uh, auto paint into the right place, but we can use it for doing things like, uh, if I come up to the top of the, uh, the viewer, I can stabilize my viewer around that motion tracking. And that's just a you know a, a simple click here. So I can paint on a on a static frame basically, um, and not have to chase around the uh, the camera. Uh, and then when I'm done with my paint, all I have to do is just turn that to none again, and then my paint is going to be in exactly the right place. And we'll see why that's useful in a moment. But if I go back to my paint now, and come into transform down the bottom right hand, I'll have a list of all of the layers that I've tracked in. In fact, I'll, I'll actually just have a list of all my layers, but the ones that are interesting are the ones I've uh, tracked. So I can take my buildings foreground here. I can choose all of the, the buildings that I've, uh, all of the strokes that I want to do. And actually I'll call this one buildings extend. We can name up our groups. We can do multiple groups. I'll hit match move. And then I'll auto paint forwards. And then I'll just, you know, sit back and watch Silhouette Paint do all the hard work for me and basically repeat all of those strokes across all of my frames. And this is amazingly useful, as you can uh, as you can imagine. So the cool thing is, let's, let's just play that back. That's looking, it's looking nice. Now the cool thing is. That I can paint on top of this again. So if I add another little group here, uh, and I'll call this one window. If I wanted to come in and maybe look, make it look like someone was at home, uh, I'm just going to take my color, and I'm just going to right click just to choose a color over here. Take my opacity down a little bit on the brush. Choose build up so we've got a bit more control over it, and I can just paint that in there and make it look as if someone's home in that particular building on that particular window. So once I've done that, I can just hit auto paint again. And that's now going to do all of those new strokes that I've created across the rest of my frames as well. Now here's the fun bit. If I come out of uh, silhouette paint, This is where it is going to get uh, it's going to get really nice and fun. Uh, except After Effects is going to crash. Of course it is. Uh, let's open up After Effects. So what happens uh, what happens now while we're waiting for After Effects to uh, load up? I'm going to open up uh, Resolve in the background. Here we go. Because I said that we can take that project and we can open it up in any other host. So while After Effects is doing its thing, I'm going to add Silhouette Paint onto my clip in Resolve. And I'll just open that up again. And I can then open up that project, which was Building Extend. 
webinar, there we go, that's the one. And there it is in Resolve. So if I come out of here, we've now got it playing back in Resolve. And this is a, a, a nice, fast playback because unlike vector paint, once we've we've done our paint in Silhouette Paint, it's a really, it, we don't have to calculate those strokes anymore. Those strokes are already written to disk. So this is what makes Silhouette Paint really, really fast, is that once we've done our job, you know, we don't have to think about the, uh, the render pane at the end of it. Uh, let's come back into After Effects, just so I can show you the same thing in After Effects. Come in here. This is what I was saying. We got that. We got that resilience, even though, um, not paint, paint. Yeah, even though uh, After Effects crashed, I can still come in, open up my project, my paint project, which is going to be here somewhere. Let's look at paint, and there it is. We haven't lost any of our work. So I'll come back out here. It doesn't want to do it. It's nice. Thanks After Effects. Well, luckily we've got uh, we've got it working in Resolve. I think there's there's something going on with uh, with GoToMeeting, I think. Go to webinar. Well we'll we'll carry on in uh, in Resolve. Hey Ben, it's Ross. It's, yeah. it's Ross here. How's it going? <laughs> it's going all right. It's going yeah, all sorry, right. To, sorry to interrupt you. I know it's uh, it can be frustrating when uh, computer's not uh, working the way you need it to. Uh, I was wondering if this is a good time to throw in a couple questions from the uh, audience. This is a perfect time <laughs> while I find my uh, while I find my project. Okay. Yeah, um, I think there's been a lot of interest in, in, so far from from the uh, the people who are here. I'm just going to kind of review a couple of things that people have been asking about. Um, one is, uh, you know, for for users who already use the full Silhouette application, just want to make it very clear that if you own a license of Silhouette 2020, which is the the most recent uh, you know major release version, then Silhouette Paint is now just a free option. So you don't have to repurchase uh, if you want to run the paint plugin if you if you're already a uh, silhouette owner on an existing uh, you know contract um, a, a couple customers or a couple uh, users here in the webinar Ben were asking about the clone tools and they yes. were asking if you could sort of elaborate on the reference frame and the ability oh, to sure. match move in in clone in the the two different match move options oh match yeah absolutely the, Cool, thanks. Uh, what we'll do then is we will, uh, let's have a little look. I'm gonna go back to another shot then, I think. So I think that's probably uh, best served with a different shot. Let's have a look at this one, yeah. Uh, and actually, if I'm going to do that, then I'm going to need to come back into After Effects because that's that's one of the, the, um, the limitations with Resolve as a host is that when we're doing uh, silhouette paint, oh, we, we don't have extra inputs into, uh, into paint with, uh, with Resolve. Uh, if we're working in, in Nuke or After Effects or Flame, then everything's cool. Uh, let's go in here. Actually, we could just look at it in Nuke. It's the same, same thing. It's all gonna be fun. It's funny, because yeah. someone's actually asking a question about running in Nuke as well. And yeah, oh, I think that's way. really, I think that's really the the main thing. You know, the the application, the the plugin is totally the same in every single host, except oh, yeah. for that one that one issue with the couple of the the hosts don't have um, the external plug uh, external input uh, option. Yeah, I think specifically Resolve, and we are coming out with uh, Vegas. That was another another question that people have been asking about. Uh, we are adding a. Uh, Vegas to our supported host list next week. But as, as you can see here in, in Nuke, uh, and this works the same way in After Effects as well, we do have two different inputs uh, to come in here. So we can pipe in uh, different sources to, to use within, um, within Silhouette Paint. Uh, let's come in here. Uh, let's actually, we'll, we'll open up 
that same one that we were working on. Um, open up the project. Here we go. And this is probably a good, as good a time as any to look at the uh, the different color spaces that we can be working in. So if I come in, I can sort of rebuild all of the frames if I need to. Um, so we can be, yeah, up in here in the display options, we've got the choice of uh, of what color space we're going to be bringing things in and what we're going to be viewing things in as well. Uh, we can also put in uh, external LUTs, which is going to be very useful for actual workflow that if we've got time at the end, I want to show you it because it's, it's actually really quite, quite cool. Um, so we can use external LUTs to help with our beauty retouch. Um, so we've got yeah full uh, full OCIO um, color support uh, within the within the viewer. So as that just sort of builds builds up again. Actually, let's stop that there. I think we'll we're going to make do. We'll make do with ninety three frames. I think we'll be fine. There we go. Yeah. So some of the other stuff that we can do with the um, with the clone tool is we've got two different ways of, of match moving uh, or, or this is this is something that, that i know that some people uh have difficulty with especially at the start um when they see match move and match move here they kind of sort of wonder what's what's going on with the match move so when we're working with the uh a, another input or in fact with a a still frame so uh, i can work in clone i can look at my foreground let's have a look in just over here uh yes yeah, so i can work with my foreground which is the original plate that we're working on uh, we can look at output which is going to be the result of the original plus the paint that we're working on and we can also work with external inputs as well which is what we uh defined uh, within the host and within that we can also change up things like frame offsets so if we wanted to sort of, if we had a, uh, a shot where we needed to clone people out within time, uh, we can stabilize out our frame uh, and then sort of just match move up the, uh, the, the frame or change the frame offset here. Uh, and we can either work with a relative frame offset. So every time we paint, it's going to be you know, 19 frames different, or we can work on an absolute frame. So whenever we paint here, it's always going to be from frame, well, 28 in this case. Now, if we wanted to do that, if we wanted to work from a, uh, a static frame or a stabilized source, but we had uh, match move data, we had our, our motion tracking data, you're gonna want to use source match move. Uh, and if we use source match move, we know that our background, or sorry, our clone source and our, um, our plate are gonna move in the same way doesn't look like much within this particular one but as soon as I go into my input one and go source match move if I just offset this a little bit uh, and maybe we'll just look at the uh, the split the uh, the vertical split there you can see that as the camera moves the clone source is also going to move if I didn't have source match move on my source would stay absolutely static. So, you know, that's that's not really what we want at all. So that's that's a way of uh, of using the source match move in addition uh, to the, the regular auto paint match move. Because what this auto paint match move is gonna do is it's just going to move the, uh, the, uh, the brush strokes that I'm working on. So if I, Bring those up. Maybe that's just bring the opacity all the way up, just so we can see that a bit bit easier. And I'll paint around. It's not going to look nice, but it's going to look clean or clear what what's happening. If I was to um, match move that now, this would only be uh, match moving those paint strokes so that they would stick in exactly the right place in relation to the the building. Whereas this source match move is actually moving the, the clone source around, but they're both using this transform data that I made within the Roto node or the Roto module, I mean. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that makes sense a lot. Um, I think that also it's good for people, especially, you know, there's typically a lot of uh, After Effects users uh, who, who come to these webinars who might be familiar with the Mocha workflow. So, hmm. I mean, kind of think of uh, if you'd actually have to apply your tracking to, you know, to both to, to both layers, essentially, or stabilize one. I know a lot yeah. of people use that sort of uh, stabilize uh based on tracking and then do their paint and then reverse the stabilization as well yeah so you know these are things that uh that silhouette can do quite quite easily without having to to build up a more complex node tree absolutely in fact let's um let's have a look at one of those uh right now something that makes makes that even more clear uh if i come to yeah come to this shot um Oh, and just just to show you, I can also apply silhouette paint in the the color page. I don't have to uh, apply it in the edit. I can just apply it here, so it doesn't really matter where we apply it. We can still be be working in the same same sort of way. Open up the silhouette interface. Uh, I will open up a project. I, the reason I'm opening up a project here is because I have already done some work on the roto side of things so if we have a look at this one uh, i've got actually two different tracks i've made a track for the uh, the background and i've made one for the arm so if we're stabilizing around the arm and i play that through you can see that the arm is going to be you know nice and nice and stable when we start to to paint on it if on the other hand we looked at the background track instead, you can see that background plate is going to be uh, nice and stable, the background there. So it's gonna be a lot easier to, to remove things like the, uh, the cleaning products in the background. So another way that we can, we can use that, if I come back into paint uh, and have this stabilized around the arm, let's just zoom into the arm a little bit. Uh, right at the very beginning, we had a few examples of that animated, uh, the animated paint, which uh, is a very sort of cool, cool look where we sort of just, you know, draw something on the arm uh, and then we come to the, the next frame. Actually, we'll start, let's start on frame zero and do this properly. So we come here and we come to the next frame and actually we'd, if we turn that off, you sort of then draw a shape along the arm and uh, sort of play it back and animate it. And that could be a little bit tricky to do if we didn't have things like the, uh, the, the viewer just locking us down. So this is the, that sort of stabilized, destabilized workflow just with a single click. But the other thing that happens now, if I move to the next frame, is that that other paint stroke disappears. So it can be a little bit tricky to, to figure out where those other paint strokes were except we have a cool onion skinning feature up at the top here. So we can, we can look you know, forwards and backwards, uh, different frames, and then mix those together. So I know where my previous stroke was. So on this one, I can come in here, I can do another stroke here, move to the next frame, move to the next frame. And because I'm working on a, uh, a nicely stabilized um, viewer, I really don't have to move my hand very much at all to get this working. So now we've got 11 frames. Let's turn off that, turn off my stabilization. And if we play that back, we we've got the, uh, the starting of a, uh, of quite a nice fun little, uh, animated paint stroke going along there. I mean, that's a, a very you know simple example but you it's a very very powerful feature uh that we have available here uh let's uh come back in and i'm just going to delete all of the work that i've done so far uh delete all frames this is not undoable yes thank you very much um we also have another uh you know, a lot of tools that we can use to to remove objects. So we don't have to be cloning stuff out. 
uh, and sometimes the clone isn't even the the sort of go-to tool for me. Uh, one of my favorites is actually the drag tool. Uh, and one of the reasons why it's my favorite uh, is, right, let's, let's show you the shapes. That's the other thing I was talking about, going back in time a little bit, uh, where we, we were talking about being able to use the, the stuff from the Roto node as holding and holdout masks for my paint. I can do that and I can make sure that it obeys my alpha channel here. So I can only paint within that shape, which is very cool. And that's that's really useful for something like the drag tool here, where what the drag tool is doing is it's sort of yeah dragging pixels from one area over to another. And let's try and get that looking kind of all right. There we go. And I'll drag that back again. Uh, maybe I'll take the opacity down a wee bit. Sort of drag that over, get that sort of matching in a bit nicer. Well, it's not perfect, but it's you know that's that's good enough for jazz. Uh, and I'll I'll do that on the arm. And let's match move that work stuff, and let's just do that all the way through. So you can start to see how um, having a good amount of tracking can help to give us a nice sort of uh, consistent result. And if we did have to make any sort of changes to this, uh, if I came to the the end, I could see that actually, you know, we're missing out a little bit of the uh, little bit of the watch there, because that side of the arm wasn't visible. Then I don't have to, you know, do too much about it. All I have to do is sort of just come in and fix it up a little bit. I think all of this stuff is just outside of my region there. So I'll, I'd probably do a little bit of better work with the roto with the shape. Uh, but we can sort of go over and there's no sort of penalty for uh, for coming in and sort of coming back in and sort of uh, making those little adjustments as we need to. And that's looking quite nice and smooth. And the difference that this is making by doing it with the drag tool instead of the, the clone tool is that because this arm is moving and rotating, it's actually really difficult to get a, uh, a nice kind of uh, clone out of this uh, with, with, a normal, um, with a normal paint system. And we'd need to also, you know, we couldn't just use a patch on this because the amount of uh, lighting that's changing between there means that a patch is just going to look really unnatural and just going to look like we stuck something on. So that's why coming in doing doing this sort of paintwork is uh, you know really really important. Cool. Any any other questions so far? I've got one other thing. I know we're uh, we're running short on time, but uh, I've got one other thing that I really want to show you. No, oh, Ben. I think we're doing we're doing good, and I think that uh, there's a lot of interest. So, uh, as far as time goes, I would just keep going with your with your going. example, and uh, I'll continue to answer the questions here on the text. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Okay. What, what I'm going to do, I've got a um, an HD, sorry, an Ultra HD shot in here, and one of the things that we need to do with uh, with Resolve, and that's something that we don't need to do with any other host is actually just make sure that when we're doing painting is that our timeline is the the same size as the uh uh as the footage um because it's because resolve can get a little bit confused about that sort of stuff uh let's let's see, let's see if i've got something i might have oh yes i do here we go i've got tracks for this and again we'll come back into our color space it's very nice to be able to just you know change up the color space when uh, when we need to uh let's have a little look on this one yeah so the the work i've done on this is uh literally just created up three different tracks for the different areas because we're going to do a little bit of, uh, of beauty work a little bit of skin retouch on this and one of the things that is amazingly important and i've said it before Having solid tracking with paint, so, so important. Having solid tracking with paint when you're doing beauty work is 
unbelievably important because when you're doing beauty, a lot of the stuff that you're doing involves very, very small areas. So any time that you make just a, a little bit of a, uh, uh, a mistake with the tracking or, you, or you're trying to do this manually, any sort of small mistake in getting those paint, um, paint strokes in exactly the right place will show up really quickly. So I've got three different, um, let's, let's just get this about. So yeah, so I've got three different types of, uh, or three different layers that I've tracked in. That's the active area. So I've got one for the cheek. So the cheek is gonna be locked down here. I've got one for the forehead, which is gonna be locked there. And I've got one for the chin. So you can see that these are all moving in, you know, very different ways, even though it looks like they should be moving in quite sort of similar ways. But um, so that's that's just to show you that it is very important to come in and get get your tracking done before you even start to think about doing some of the paint work. Now, when it comes to retouching skin, there's there's probably one go-to tool uh, that isn't clone again, uh, and this is my blemish tool. Now. The blemish tool, if I just uh, let's zoom in so we can see what that's doing, hopefully the compression of the uh, the webinar thing will make this a bit obvious. So I click on that. Actually, let's just reset all of this because this is looking far too nice. There we go. It's remembering what I did before. There we go. So what the blemish tool does is a, is a combination of um, softening out the area underneath the brush and then adding some grain over the top of it to try and make it, you know, hide the fact that we've done uh, some some sort of blurring, some softening to the skin. Now, if we don't have that done in a nice way, you can see what that uh, that noise is looking like. I mean, that's that's really visible. And if you think it's visible now, you just wait until you see that moving. Then it becomes, you know, amazingly visible. So when we're setting up the blemish tool, what I like to do is just go into the individual color channels, which we can do in the top right hand corner, RGB. And again, use that compare mode, that compare here with the vertical split. And we can see the before and the after. So with this one, all I have to do is I'll come down to the softness on this. Um, I know the softness should be set to one and I can just take the amount down as well. Now this is going to be, you know, this is not going to come through on the, uh, with all the, the compression, this is uh, going to be a little bit difficult to see, but basically going through the red, green and blue channels there, blue I know needs a little bit more noise than the other channel. It's usually where a lot of the noise gets hidden, but three, three, four, that's looking all right. Yeah, that should should do us okay. So once we've got that set up, let's turn off the compare mode there. I take my brush so it's just big enough to cover the blemish. Just do one tap and that should get rid of it. I'm gonna zoom this out a little bit and just tap, tap, tap. A little bit here. I'm not gonna do too many, even though we can. Uh, this is This is one of the things where we can just do like absolutely go to town because we've got, you know, all of the, um, we don't have to worry about the speed of, of uh, what's going to happen when we've got, you know, 50 or 100 or 200 paint, uh, paint strokes. We can just sort of go to town here. Now, uh, let's have a look at the before and the after. Now, when I'm doing another thing that I like to do when I'm doing any sort of skin work is come back into our display options up at the top of the viewer here and use a LUT. Uh, and I've got a various various numbers of sort of false color LUTs here. These You can actually grab these for, for free on the internet or you can create your own. If you're in Resolve, it's very easy to create your own LUTs. And what we can do here is we can use these false color ones to kind of see where the worst of those blemishes are going to be. So where we would expect like a nice uh, smooth sort of uh, result here. We're getting a, a little 
you know, big spike in the colors. And that's, that's showing us where our blemishes are. So if we use the blemish tool over these areas here, we can easily see where our blemishes are that we need to get rid of. What we can also see, if I make this a bit bad, uh, let's, um, what am I gonna do here? Okay, let's, let's turn my blur radius up a little bit. What we can also see is if I make a mistake with a particular tool, if we're in one of these false color modes on the, with the, uh, a LUP, then we can easily see where our mistakes have been made. So if I turn off my LUP there, you can see that's not looking very pretty at all. So, you know, that's that's a cool little workflow that's just uh, that's just there in the display mode. Um, another couple of quick things that we've got uh, is the ability not to just be painting in the color channels. Uh, if you look down on the bottom right hand here, uh, we can you know we can choose whether we're painting in RGB or just the RG. B color channels or even the alpha, uh, which is I've used quite a lot to sort of clean up some uh, some sort of green screen stuff where we've had to kind of yeah fiddle about with uh, with hair and things. So there's always always need to go in and uh, fiddle about with with alpha channels a bit of the time. But underneath that we have these three buttons that are normal, color, and detail. If I look at my viewer we can actually break our image out into just looking at what the color's doing or just looking at what the detail is doing. And this is really, really important because a lot of the time when we're dealing with skin, we're actually not dealing with, um, you know, problems that are, are both in the color and the detail channels. So the, the color in the skin can be looking absolutely fine. And the, or the deed and the detail can be looking a little bit, you know, uh, scraggy. So what I can do here is I can, well, if let's come to uh, the clone tool, for example. And I can only be, and maybe I'll only just clone in the uh, the detail layer here, and I can just clone out stuff within. Oh, maybe not that one there. There we go. Just clone stuff out within the um, or within the detail layer, so we're not kind of getting rid of things like the uh, the nice normal texture of the skin. All we're doing is just getting rid of uh, the uh, you know the the sort of nasty bits that are kind of irking the eye. So we're always sort of cloning from a good bit of skin over the top. Of one of the blemishes and here we kind of keep keep kind of natural natural skin rather than getting that horrible plasticky look and we're also getting rid of those blemishes at the same time the other thing we can do is just be painting in the color area as well so here if we have a little look at this one we've got a little bit of discoloration in the uh, in the skin just around the uh, the mouth so if I come into my uh, color tool here or, uh, and just right click just to sample or right click and hold to sample a nice bit of skin color there, I'll take my opacity down. I've got build up turned on so I can just sort of gently go over this area and just get rid of some of that discoloration that we had just there. Now, last thing before I go, I, I could literally be talking about this for hours if you uh, if you let me, but I'm, we, we do need to go. Uh, one last thing with the clone tool, which is amazingly useful for, uh, for doing skin work, is, let's uh, come in here, is we've got uh, things like grade and filter and uh, warp as well. So what grade and filter lets us do is it lets us do color correction as we're cloning. And that's you know that's what warp does as well. So we can either kind of come in and you know do all this ourselves, but when we're dealing with skin, it's very useful just to be able to turn on auto grade. And this means if I have auto grade turned off and I clone from here over to here, 
you can easily see it. In fact, you can even even more easily see it if I have the uh, opacity turned up to 100. Doesn't look great. If I have auto gray turned on and do the same stroke, what it's going to try to do is match the colors uh, in the destination from the uh, from the source. So basically, what we're getting is nice natural skin tones from any area without kind of uh, those kind of dead giveaway bits uh, when you're doing cloning from one area to another. I'm going to do the same same stroke, but with auto gray turned off. You see that really easily. Now let's do this over here. Auto gray turned off, looks horrible. Auto gray turned on, you can't see it. It just looks, it looks right. And there's there's tons and tons of little features like that uh, within Silhouette that are just going to absolutely revolutionise uh, the way you do uh, paintwork, not just for for removes or extensions, uh, but for beauty work as well. It makes you know it makes high end beauty work um, a lot lot faster. Um, you know that's something that's that's you know historically taken uh, quite a lot of time to uh, to go through and do. But it's a, a lot easier and a lot better when you're working with um, uh, with silhouette paint. Let's have a look at my little before and after on this. It's probably easier if I see it in the edits. Let's bring that down. There we go. And we'll finish that off. Get rid of everything else here. So we zoom in a little bit on this one. We can start to see. Let's zoom out a wee bit more there. Yeah, you can start to see that we can really start to clean up uh, skin and uh, and make that look really nice and natural. And using the power of auto paint to then automate all of those strokes across the uh, the rest of the frames as well. So taking really sort of taking the heavy lifting out of doing this work and getting a nice smooth and consistent result. And that, when it comes to paint, as I said before, the most important thing that we've got is consistency. Uh, and that's that's really what you can get with that hybrid paint system that we have with Silhouette Paint. Cool. I think, um, I think I'm going to leave it there uh, and we'll go back to, to sort of doing some last questions and doing the giveaway, I think. But thank you very much.